So I would like to uh, open the first of the keynotes in East. Uh, Keynote East, Open Minds brings open collaboration and introduce Dr. Paresh, uh, who we're thrilled to have here, both because of the, the scope of topic and his uh, activity as outlined here, and I'll go through, but also as an opportunity to just continue to reinforce the global nature of the conference uh, that we've undertaken here. So to Dr. Paresh has an uh, interest in exploring the unknown known regions of the human genome, looking for hypothetical proteins, has uh, developed an interest in non-coding RNAs, elucidating the mechanisms uh, underpinning a small molecular interactions through the use of uh, investigating clinical exomes. Uh, was in 2005 the founder of Bioclues, and, and well done Prash, that's a, a great name, the Bioinformatics Club for Experimenting Scientists, love it. So Bioclues, which is India's largest bioinformatics society and has been pivotal in mentoring uh, over 2,000 uh, graduates in 30 countries thus far. So thank you Prash for uh, agreeing to be the opening keynote speaker. I'm looking forward to your talk and I will now fade into the background and hand over running of Remo to you. And thank you once again. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Gareth, for your kind uh, introduction. I hope you could uh, see my screen, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. We can so, see your screen. Yeah. So, yes. So, uh, this indeed is uh, a wonderful conference, as you see, you know, from uh, uh, the last uh, keynote uh, address. And uh, especially Remo, it's been a wonderful platform. Thank you so much, Gareth. Dave, uh, Nomi, and uh, other organizers uh, for your kind invitation. Um, so, so my talk would be uh, especially on open mind springs, uh, open collaborations. Uh, this particular title is uh, considered because uh, as a founder, we faced uh, a lot of challenges. I, I personally faced a lot of challenges. And of course, you know, all the founding members, all the board of directors of BioClues, we did face some uh, Herculean tasks uh, towards uh, mentor building um, for Indian communities, Indian bioinformatics communities. And uh, we just thought uh, that probably, you know, this could be a wonderful uh, um, entity for uh, other developing countries as well, probably you not know, to emulate how, how, how we did overcome, you know, the real challenge. Uh, but uh, before we begin, uh, I, as you see, I'm standing here and I'm ever grateful to these four Gs. Uh, the reason I'll probably certainly tell you, uh, of course, the gurus, uh, it could be our spiritual gurus, my spiritual guru or uh, my computational gurus, uh, my mentors, uh, and of course, my mentees as well. You know, many times, you know, we do learn a lot of things you know, from our mentees as well. Uh, but this particular talk is dedicated to uh, Galaxy, certainly, uh, uh, and of course, you no know, more to James Taylor. Uh, the reason is, as you could see, you know, at the central point of this particular slide, uh, this particular work of us, bioinformatics and NGS, uh, you know, which is important to understand the huge data, uh, this was uh, featured uh, as a focal uh, theme uh, of this particular journal, Indian Journal of Cancer, uh, way back in 2015. Uh, this work was started by uh, a bunch of young undergraduate students who were doing their BSc uh, and um, a few uh, MSCs, and we used Galaxy, and that was where you know uh, we started doing this. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of you know next generation sequencing tools, um, analyzing uh, huge data sets. You know. Uh, comparing the tobacco chewers with uh, the non-tobacco chewers and of course you know the lung cancer data sets as well and that was when you know uh, James was there we did exchange you know some of the emails to the galaxy community because we were also pretty new to that and uh, 
James and the Galaxy team were really kind enough, you know, to help us, you know, with all these, you know, um, helping stuff, you know, identifying, you know, the prospective tools and all. So this was just, you know, uh, when Galaxy began, I believe. Galaxy was founded in 2010 and in 2011, January, we started it. And that was as a part of my first postdoc. I was, you know, piggybacking between uh, Boston, Denmark and India at that point of time. And of course, the third uh, uh, G is the genomes and of course the genes. That's because, you know, uh, we take uh, a lot of uh, enriching information from them. That is how, you know, we become the researchers, you know, within these genomes. And of course, the fourth one uh, is Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, in fact, incidentally, we are celebrating his 150th anniversary, the last one year, uh, the birth anniversary. And uh, you'll be surprised to know that uh, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his, his teachings, is we often you know bringing up in you know, all those kind of things that are absolutely open, and uh, as Indians, you know we feel you know pretty proud, and uh, I at least I personally feel that probably you know he is is the father of open access. You know, is that's because you know everything you know he just owned uh, a loin cloth on his body, and everything is absolutely open access. So. This is where I come from, although I'm a founder of BioClues, uh, which is a virtual not-for-profit organization. Um, I'm currently at Birla Institute of Scientific Research in Jaipur in uh, Western India, the last four years. And our current chairman is C.K. Birla, ours is absolutely a philanthropic research institute. And um, uh, our institute is headed by uh, uh, Purnand Ghosh, who is our executive director with uh, Krishna Mohan who is head R&D. And we're a group of 14 scientists in two main uh, departments. One is Department of Biotechnology and Bioinformatics, as you could see from the picture. And we also have got a wonderful uh, uh, planetarium and remote sensing department uh, where we take you know, geospatial satellite images and collect the flora and fauna uh, by taking uh, help of those uh, uh, particular, you know, particular uh, uh, geospatial tags. And we have, of course, you now uh, the biggest auditorium in uh, northwestern India, which is a 1300 seater and, of course, a science museum. So, uh, so I'll not disappoint uh, the scientific community more, uh, more towards the bioinformatics community. Uh, um, and, and, and it should not be in a bit sermonical. So I just thought, you know, I'll split my talks into three. Uh, one is uh, the how open are we, the making of three C's. Uh, which probably I'll uh, try to deliberate how, how we did overcome you know, some of the important challenges in BioClues. This is what I'm just going to talk. And uh, maybe the last 20 minutes, I'll probably talk about the systems genomics made serendipity. How, how, did, how, how, how did we identify you know, long known coding RNAs you know, from exomes? And of course, the recent you know, SARS CoV 2 hijacking of mitochondria and the role of long known coding RNAs. So uh, way back in 2011, I believe, you know, 10 and 11, you know, uh, India was facing uh, a big challenge. 80% of the articles published were absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely haywire. You know, they were either uh, in predatory journals or many of those particular articles that were published were uh, presumed to be, you know, retracted. That was, you know, that was a kind of a worrisome fi uh, picture for us uh, as, as an open access institute, you know, where we try, where we try for mentoring, uh, 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 mentoring, uh, uh, you know, the young graduates. So, so as you could see, you know, from these particular pictures, all the red ones were absolutely, you know, very, uh, uh, very worrisome pictures, you know, enfeebling, self citations, flabbergasting, predatory publishing plagiarism, which was absolutely a worrisome factor. And we just thought that, you know, is there any solution that, you know, we could come up with, you know, through BioClues, where we could probably uh, mentor young graduate students. So we began with a survey and to utter surprise uh, that uh, eight in 10 student researchers do not know what, you know, COPE, COPE is. COPE, as many of you know, it's Committee on Publication Ethics. There are certain uh, jargons and rules you know, that needs to be followed and if there are any articles you know that uh, go in uh, so-called in you know, a predatory 
uh, uh, publishers avenue that is absolutely a very some factor because you know that would uh, undermine the quality of the research and uh, the second uh, uh, reason that we understood was you know in india unlike the west or probably unlike the far east uh, including the asia pacific countries we lack you know a good stem curriculum which is uh, science technology engineering and medicine because many of the students you know do not have that math logic so probably you know they cannot you know understand that kind of you know, programming concepts so either uh, biology or mathematics were uh, an obvious choice and of course the women mentees because many of these particular young graduates you know uh, uh, yeah, as per the indian conditions and as per the indian stigma uh, you know they need to probably you know uh, take up their uh, career pretty uh, you know pretty uh, uh, pretty well in advance or probably you know they may they, they may want to be get married so, so 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 these are the kind of you know things that everyone would really look into so we identified you know some of the reasons so uh, of uh, these particular reasons i mean many many young students or many young faculty members uh, 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 you know young uh, tenure track faculty uh, they would love to talk about publications but you know seldom you know do they do they do they discuss you know, failures you know probably they don't really look look into the aftermath of that so so as you could see one of the main challenges that we had was the mentor mentor relationships because an ideal uh, for teach or mentee uh, is uh, 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 would always you know uh, crave for a good mentor that was not really happening you know be it a virtual mentor like us or probably you know uh, an on site mentor and uh, you know that was how because uh, that is how you know uh, 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 you know uh, the mentees you know, would really identify the mentors but um, but it so happened that uh, that was the time you know where young faculty would also think of this uh, adage you know uh, publish or perish you know uh, but you know we thought you know that probably we should not glorify publish or perish probably we would probably ask them you know first comes perform and then comes you know publish so uh, and then you know we go for monitoring them whether or not you know they're coming up with some good results whether or not those particular uh, performance is really uh, you know leading to a good you know publishing track record so so what 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 we needed at that point of time was these three c's which which invariably we believe that you know these three c's three c's are applicable uh, even these uh, post covid times because many researchers are also sitting out, sitting at home you know doing good science so one of them is of course collaborations that would bring you know immense diversity because we'll have a multifaceted disciplinarians you know coming together and um, discuss and of course you know we also talk about convergence where you know we could uh, bring up you know inclusiveness you now uh, where uh, we can you know converge you know different ideas and come together and uh, most importantly whether or not you know we are uh, good listeners or not so that's where you know the control of over mind you know would really come into picture so these three c's uh, were absolutely needed and uh, this is how you know uh, we started way back in 2005 and Pratish is my co-founder uh, you'll be surprised to know that we never met until last year which means the last 15 years we never met and it was only last year you know we met for the first time and uh, and then we asked oh you are the guy you know uh, uh, you know uh, where where, uh, where we chatted you know one fine morning uh, in 2005 and that was how you know uh, we started this biogroups and uh, one way uh, we feel pretty uh, happy uh, that you know uh, so far you know we have got about 4000 active members and more than about 7000 uh, uh, members all together uh, among them 2000 of them uh, were virtually mentored so far and many of them are really placed in different laboratories all over the world and uh, we also have several bits which we call them as biocruise interest groups we also have a women in biology forum which is probably the first of its forum in uh, uh, south asia and uh, together uh, we have got about 25 publications between uh, impact factors you know 2 and uh, 17 although i really hate to talk about these impact factors and and we have been in you know, a thriving bio community you know thanks to these you know wonderful uh, you know board members you know uh, where you know we uh, we really you know keep discussing the things and we really talk about uh, uh, 
uh, talk about you know uh, mentoring capacities uh, to the to, to the prospective mentees. So uh, uh, and these are the coffee mugs we usually give to the prospective mentees if, if everything goes on well. And this is how we did. So what what we usually do is we identify prospective mentee who is an absolute need. Every day we get anywhere between eight to 10 emails on an average. And we uh, talk to them many a time, you know, we also uh, give them a call. We ask them uh, their WhatsApp number, we chat, we set certain timelines, we give them some tasks. Uh, we also give them, you know, uh, the prospective deliverables and uh, we just ask them to ensure that, you know, the milestones are really met. And of course, most importantly, we talk about openness. You know, this openness in, is absolutely you know, very critical you know, for a prospective mentee to nurture himself or herself and become a prospective mentor the next probably the next decade. And, uh, and then most important stuff, we also place these prospective mentees by, um, by discussing uh, their prospective projects uh, with various industries. So this is what we have, the ethics statement. We ensured that all the 2000 active members take up this ethics statement because of the worrisome factor of that predatory publication that we have had uh, since 2011. Uh, and at least, you know, we are coming up with small goals, small achievable goals, because we did mentor only 2000 graduate students, but, uh, but you know, that gives us uh, an insatisfaction. So once they take up this so-called, uh, you know, uh, ethics statement, they uh, ensure that, you know, we ensure that, you know, they pass on the baton to this next generation. Maybe once a candidate, you know, graduates from his or her school, probably, you know, they would pass on the baton, you know, to his prospective junior who is coming up. And of course, uh, in 1999, there was an article, you know, that came up uh, saying that Hippocratic Oath for scientists, you know, that was a science, uh, you know, brevia article. Um, you know, there used to be brevia, you know, short articles. And, um, you know, uh, usually if some of you don't know, uh, Hippocratic Oath is usually catered for uh, biologists uh, or uh, medical scientists or uh, medical practitioners uh, before they operate upon, uh, you know, uh, a patient or before they come up with surgery. So any doctor would really go for Hippocratic Oath. Uh, but you know, we as uh, researchers, we as scientists, probably you know, we do not have that Hippocratic Oath. Uh, so we also ensure that you know, this Hippocratic Oath is also rendered. And uh, we ask these prospective mentees you know, to come up with this I swear statement so that you know, we can keep the research vitality in the best interests of science. So, 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 so if you really look, you know, there are some immense challenges. Uh, uh, in fact, you know, uh, the Fecade uh, publishing, you know, could give room for uh, so-called, you know, preprints or open access publishing, which is absolutely going in a uh, very good spirit. I would, I would definitely say that, but, but it still needs to uh, give that particular value uh, to the less developed countries. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, many of them, you know, are coming up in Africa and as well as in Asia. And uh, uh, the fair peer review, of course, you know, we need to have an open up peer review policies. You know, maybe the peer review statements you know, could, could come up you know, after every article. Like many uh, of these peer review uh, policies have really come up, you know, thanks to eLife, you know, which is my favorite journal. And uh, self citations doesn't uh, matter at all. This is absolutely a bad practice. Probably, you know, what we need to talk is about citations, the SCI, which we talk about the science, not, not, the, not the citable entity. And of course, uh, uh, flabbergasting, you know, many people, although uh, his himself, he, he feels that an H index is absolutely good. Uh, uh, you know, many, many, many a time, you know, many researchers, you know, think that, you know, uh, uh, if their H index is quite good, that would probably uh, mean that you know their uh, research is highly cited, uh, which which probably uh, uh, may not be true many a time. So so this is where you know the collaborative index you know comes into picture. This is what we probably uh, propose. Uh, uh, probably uh, uh, I I take I've taken liberty in uh, taking this uh, C uh, index calculation in the name of James Taylor. Uh, whom we should, uh, you know, remember. 
So, uh, say for instance, you know, James uh, has had about uh, 115 co-authors so far. I mean, uh, and from these 115 co-authors, uh, many of these co-authors in turn have got their own co-authors, including James, and that would you know bring up you know n factorial uh, entities. So, if you really sum up the list, that would bring up to about c equals 87. So, this is where you know, we are you know, trying to come up with a picture. So here, uh, uh, in case of James, uh, he has had about 48 uh, uh, H index, but in case of the C index or C equals 87, which is quite, you know, uh, uh, you know, substantiating and probably this gives us uh, enough room saying that, you know, collaborations play a wonderful role. Uh, one such particular thing, so during uh, uh, the lockdown period in India, we had a survey, as you could see, uh, this is about uh, uh, all the all the uh, BioClose members participating in the survey, and and, and thanks to mentoring services, uh, about 52.6 percent people believe that you know they could manage the work-life balance uh, during these lock 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 times, uh, and and of course, you know, 15.4 percent feel that they're depressed, but their mentoring capabilities uh, with BioClose you know help 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 them move forward. So. So the first part of my conclusion says that uh, collaborations play a very, very important role. That's how you know, the organizations should really foster uh, the knowledge and try for it. And this was how we launched uh, BioClues on October 2nd, 2005, which incidentally is the birth anniversary of uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And then uh, we went on to uh, start real mentoring from 2006. We introduced a lot of fellowships. We have a budding and thriving and active uh, women in biology community. Uh, and then that was the year, you know, where we became an affiliate of AP Bionet and ISCB. And uh, we introduced Bird Awards, the BioClues Innovation Research Development Awards in 2010. We floated a journal. Then uh, this is where, you know, we have our own cloud-based servers through which, you know, we'll probably, you know, take up these uh, uh, things, you know, right now. Of course, we have student chapters and uh, the BioClose vision group, you know, that uh, we call it as BioVig, you know, that really needs to be transformed to the next generation. And of course, we really look forward to have this uh, uh, BOF Galaxy BioClose, you know, taking up or sh uh, shaping up, you know, the next, uh, you know, few years. So, so, so that ends to my part one. The second one is about systems genomics made serendipity, identifying long known coding RNAs from exomes. So the prelude to this is uh, way back in 2004 when I started my PhD in Denmark. I was really fascinated about the Human Genome Project, but many of them, uh, you know, uh, were misannotated or unannotated. So many of them uh, were, uh, were the so-called the known unknowns, which means uh, we know whether or not a gene exists, but whether or not the function of it is uh, known is not really known. So, so that's where you know the known knowns, the known unknowns, unknown knowns uh, were absolutely coined uh, at that point of time, and um, there are so many of them, you know, uh, you know, lying up. And we published a lot of you know these kind of you know uh, uh, studies, you know, taking up uh, the piggybacking mechanism of uh, mismatch repair protein MLH1. And um, because an you know, MLH1 has got a protein, you know, somewhere localized in nucleus. But uh, if uh, mitochondrial DNA repair fails, then the protein, you know, would come to the rescue of uh, 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 the mitochondrial uh, stuff and does some repairing, and it goes back. So this is how you know we we uh, identified it. You know, thanks to my mentor, Lena Yul Rasmussen. Uh, who is currently at University of Copenhagen. Uh, then we coined hypothome. Hypothome is a question of hypothetical interactions of predicted proteins, and that is how we thought. But, um, but eventually what we realized was many of these known unknowns could be non-coding RNAs as well. That is where we call these hypothetical proteins as predecessors of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, the non-coding RNAs, especially the long non-coding RNAs. So this is how you know we developed a database of hypothetical proteins in human, which is hosted in BioCruise as well, and uh, we uh, put up a lot of you know CGI interfaces. And as of now, 
There are about 1,015 manually curated records of these hypothetical proteins in human per se, uh, but many of them, you know, could ideally be wonderful candidates. You know, they could they could they could even play a wonderful role. You know, even for development of aptamers, development of small molecules, development of you know nanomers or aphima based small molecular approaches. So, so what I was just you know, trying to explain is that uh, there are known unknowns and these known unknowns could be the non-coding RNAs and these non-coding RNAs could have coding potential and they could really play you know, a very important role in the uh, interaction studies. And uh, as, I, as I told you, the known unknowns are uh, the hypothetical proteins that could be the predecessors of these non-coding RNAs, primarily the long non-coding RNAs. And if you really ask uh, the non-coding RNAs, um, there are two main non-coding RNAs which people talk about. One is uh, the microRNAs, the other one is uh, the long non-coding RNAs. MicroRNAs are pretty short, they are 22 to 24 bases, they are absolutely uh, conserved or highly conserved across the genomes. That would uh, 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 allow us not to consider them uh, for the reason being, for the reason being uh, uh, we may not really identify a good number of polymorphisms in them. So since the genetic variation is best seen in the non-coding RNAs, uh, probably you know, long non-coding RNAs could ideally serve as you know, wonderful regulatory molecules. So that really begged us a kind of a question. So when I moved back, when I was studying my group here in India, uh, I was, uh, uh, I was uh, uh, summoned up with this particular problem in India in Rajasthan, the state where I'm in, there is a rare disease called uh, congenital pouch colon. And this congenital pouch colon is uh, often seen in uh, young children aged, uh, aged. I mean, it's, it's, it's a congenital as soon as the child is born. Uh, and, and of course, you know, it persists uh, until, you know, the child is really operated. As you could see, uh, you know, uh, uh, at, at, at the belly, you know, you find a lot of pouch-like or sac-like entity, which is really coming from the, uh, you know, uh, urethral cavity. The child's, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, fecal matter, you know, goes pretty worse and, and it's it's absolutely in a very, uh, you know, deliberated situation. So we identified a lot of uh, mutations. That was the first of its kind of its study uh, in this rare disease. And then we uh, published this and we found a lot of uh, good number of variants, many of them looking into uh, the urogenital diseases. We found some of those particular candidates uh, and, and, and it all went well. But one fine day, uh, you know, we were doing some experiments in the lab. Uh, and then, um, you know, since as a, as a systems biologist, and I'm absolutely fond of the Smith Waterman, I'll get them, you know. So uh, I uh, uh, and my, 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 my PhD fellow and uh, myself, you know, uh, we just thought we'll simply blast the entire uh, exomic chunks or uh, the exome sequences that we have uh, in the form of raw FASTQ reads converted to FASTQ uh, to the uh, human non-code database. And then to our surprise, we found a couple of long non-coding RNAs. And then we asked whether or not it's an artifact, whether or not the library uh, uh, preparation or the kind of, you know, the intron exonic boundaries were ideally not chopped or whether or not any of those particular regions were not really, uh, you know, good. So the bona fidelity of it was absolutely checked. Uh, it so happened that uh, 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 the library uh, preparation was absolutely good, but you no, know, there was a long known coding RNA just sitting uh, upstream of this exonic chunk, which, which in fact, you know, this is a link, which is a long integent non-coding RNA, which means it's really sitting between, uh, you know, between the uh, intron exon boundaries of uh, the entire uh, uh, gene here. This particular gene is this EPB41, iPhone 1, iPhone, high, uh, iPhone 1, which, which is uh, called and then we asked whether or not this long non-coding RNA would really interact with any of the causal chains uh, associated with this pouch column. And to our surprise, there was a KIF13A, which is uh, uh, a kinase. Uh, of course, you, know, you pretty well know with kinases, you know, these are all uh, uh, 
uh, not so uh, good or not so stable interactions, but, but we checked this bona fidelity uh, using two-way approach. One is we employed something called micro-scale thermophoresis, which is a biophysical characterization approach. So we checked uh, this particular thing in wild type and as well as in the affected samples, as you could see from the sigmoidal curve, uh, you know, uh, these are all uh, the long known coding RNAs in the proteins you know, that are absolutely lined across these particular sigmoidal curve. So this indicates that uh, there is a chance that these two are, uh, you know, physically interacting. So this would probably uh, pave way in not using the uh, experiments like pull down assays or coimino precipitation. So whereas in the wild type, as you could see, they are they are, they are, they are poles apart. So there is no interaction at all. And this is what we published. And uh, until then, uh, we were checking whether or not any such particular studies were really uh, 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 were really uh, progressive in these directions. Um, and um, and until until uh, the review process was done, we got to know that there was another uh, paper in PNAS you know, that really came up, which was absolutely very exciting, and that was also in gray disease. So so the part two of uh, uh, the conclusions of part two. So there is a chance that the long known coding RNAs uh, from exomes uh, could be in place. They, they could be uh, in reality. In fact, this is not targeted genome sequencing. We checked the bidirectional best blast heads. We uh, went on to see and uh, isolated that long known coding RNA you know, from our samples across all the uh, 16 uh, trio exomes. And uh, we thought you know, that this could be a wonderful entity. So not only that, we identified some role of this long known coding RNA towards regulation. And uh, we also identified the open chromatin elements associated with these long known coding RNA, which currently you know, we are uh, you know, experimenting with this you know, pouch column. And, um, uh, and, uh, and, and moving, moving, moving further, uh, this particular long known coding RNA, of course, uh, plays a very important role uh, in uh, prostate as well, because it's highly expressed in cancer prostate. So uh, during the lockdown times, of course, I'm in the lab now, I'm in my office in Jaipur. Uh, but you know, we were forced to sit at home and that was how you know this uh, blessing in disguise has really come and this is a story about uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, hijacking of mitochondria and the role of long known coding RNAs. So uh, this work was uh, uh, done along with Keshav Singh uh, who was my uh, um, PhD uh, co-mentor when I started my PhD in 2004 is at University of Alabama. Uh, is uh, a Harvard Fellow of uh, Mitochondrial Research. He's an eminent uh, mitochondrial uh, research leader. So, so uh, like uh, like uh, everyone, you know, we also got pretty excited. We have become opportunists. SARS-CoV-2 is really taking place. And as a systems biologist, uh, my thought process was more towards, uh, you know, understanding the host, you know, what would happen if SARS-CoV-2 uh, attacks the host. Uh, why is that? You know, there are a lot of you know asphyxiating cells. What would happen to the uh, host in terms of uh, uh, in terms of you know uh, the viral uh, uh, capsid you know engulfing the host cells? So there were a lot of you know other studies, and we just thought uh, that maybe you know I was taking my own experience, rich experience of taking these hypothetical proteins and checking if any of these hypothetical proteins. Uh, could be uh, viably used for development of, you know, uh, protein actomers. So, uh, but but that didn't really work, uh, although the work currently is still uh, going on. Um, what we did was we walked through the entire SARS-CoV-2 and checked what are those epitope targeted sites, what are those particular regions that are absolutely exposed. And uh, if there are any residues that are exposed, that would indicate that those are the residues where you know we could probably uh, target. So, so this includes, of course, the four structural proteins: the mens, what we call it, call them as membrane, envelope, nuclear capsid, and the spike. And of course, there are also the non-structural proteins. And one of my favorite uh, non-structural proteins is NSP10, for which you know we designed you know aptamers. That is that is absolutely uh, a different story. But I'll just sum up by saying that. 
in SARS-CoV-2, we don't have ORF3B, which is absolutely very important uh, uh, protein. And uh, this uh, hypothetical open reading frame absence indicates that uh, this has been engulfed with the host mitochondrial DNA, and that's where you know SARS-CoV-2 attacks the host cells, takes the mitochondrial DNA into uh, its uh, into its credit, and uh, hijacks the uh, DNA, and then uh, uh, as a result, you know, in a cell, in a healthy cell, usually about uh, about you know 200 to 2,000 mitochondria exists in a healthy cell. But uh, in, an, uh, in, a, in an unhealthy cell or in a deprived cell, you find only 20 or 30. So which means since there are no mitochondria, you'll have a lot of you know, asphyxiating cells. So that asphyxiation leads to the death of the patient. So this is a hypothesis that uh, uh, we have really come up. And uh, in interim, we also identified the non-consensus sequences, which could be an absolute or ideal candidates for this epitopes. So we have uh, LX uh, LC uh, here in this case, uh, which can be a wonderful candidate for ORF3A. Uh, as you could see, ORF3B, we couldn't find any non consensus sequences if we walk through all the genomes. So as you could see at the extreme left, you have the Wuhan, the erstwhile Wuhan, uh, which came up in 2004, I believe, and then uh, the COVID 2, Wuhan 2. Wuhan, and then Korea, Japan, Spain, USA. Uh, so we have taken all the continental uh, things. Of course, we've also taken the India genomes and we have identified all the non-consensus sequences where you know we are just trying to come up with an aptama-based So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, you know, I think we lost somewhere over here. Um, I apologize uh, for disappointing you. Uh, but uh, you know the take home message from this particular slide is ORF3B, which is a hypothetical open reading frame, is absent in SARS-CoV-2, whereas it is present in SARS-CoV-1. And that is uh, the big difference uh, uh, where uh, we are just you not know, trying to understand, uh, you know, towards mitochondrial uh, hijacking uh, by SARS-CoV-2. So what we uh, did was, uh, we walked through the entire SARS-CoV-2, which is about 29.9 kb uh, genome in size, and we checked what are those uh, 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 non-repetitive sequences uh, across these different ORFs, which are absolutely exposed, they're not really buried, and these exposed uh, residues could absolutely play a very important role uh, towards um, uh, you know, uh, development of aptamers, which could be you know, viable targets. And, and not only that, these could be those particular sequences where, you know, epitopes you know, could really be, you know, uh, bound to that. So likewise, we have also identified uh, some signature sequences. So which uh, in this case, we have uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, AD and K signature sequences in ORF7A. In ORF7B, we have uh, something called uh, uh, LX, uh, QD, XX motifs, which are specific to RF7B and uh, RF8 and as well as RF9. As you could see, uh, we have cross-checked this particular uh, sequences, as you could see, uh, right from, uh, uh, you know, COVID-1 Wuhan, which is an erstwhile SARS-CoV-1 uh, genome uh, that was uh, well known uh, from 2004 days. We compared this with uh, all the continental uh, sequences. So, for example, we have COVID-1 here in ORF3A, and we compared it with uh, COVID-2 Wuhan, uh, COVID-2 Korea, COVID-2 Japan, Spain, USA, uh, Brazil, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so moving further, uh, what we hypothesized was when SARS-CoV-2 uh, attacks the host, uh, it uh, is well received by this receptor ACE2 or the transmembrane uh, protein, which is TMPRSS2. And that's where the uh, viral RNA and non coding uh, RNAs of the host is uh, uh, encapsized. And that's where this mitochondrial manipulation takes place. And that's how the uh, mitochondria gets hijacked. And moving forth, 
uh, the mitochondria gets fragmented and as a result, uh, if in a healthy cell, if there are anywhere between 200 to 2000 mitochondrion per cell, in a uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, infected patient, uh, that would you know, come down to drastically to about you know, 20 or less. So as a result, you know, the cells become asphyxiating and, um, and the entire you know, uh, uh, cells you know, keep dying. And as a result, uh, we, we get in a lot of you know, fatalities. So, uh, so in this particular process, uh, we have identified four long non coding RNAs and incidentally, one of them is highly expressed in prostate, uh, which plays a very important role, um, you know, from a recent uh, study uh, where uh, Swiss group have observed that if at all, uh, uh, if uh, androgen uh, deprived therapy, uh, prostate cancer patients, uh, are, if at all, if they have been attacked with SARS-CoV-2 or if they have been, you know, with the COVID-19 infection, uh, they are more likely to survive than, uh, than, than, than other patient who is not really associated with prostate cancer. So, so this has really, you know, begged us a kind of a lot of questions because we have done a lot of exomes and transcriptomes in our lab. So uh, we have even identified uh, prostate cancer relevant uh, polymorphisms uh, in relation to uh, the diet factors as well, because uh, many vegetarians in India and from our cohort, over 90% of the samples are vegetarians and yet, you know, they're prone to prostate. We are just, you know, trying to begin, trying to understand and begin to, uh, uh, begin to, you know, narrate down this kind of experience. So we might, you know, uh, possibly, you know, come up with a simplest strip-based uh, kit, uh, at least, you know, uh, from the Indian continent where, you know, with the simplest urine, you know, we could say whether or not a person is a prostate cancer victim or not. So, so the take home message at this point of time is uh, the long non coding RNAs uh, uh, play a very important role towards the mitochondrial hijacking of SARS CoV 2. Uh, we need a lot of sequences to understand. Uh, it's not just uh, we need uh, only one or two, uh, uh, one, or, or, or one or two sequences, you know, to uh, uh, better disseminate understanding the SARS-CoV-2, more likely the long known coding RNA chemistry that we are uh, trying to talk about. Uh, although there are about 50,000 uh, sequences that are publicly available, we need more of these particular sequences. And, 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 and more to that, you know, the take home message from these particular slides is we need collaboration. We also need, you know, some kind of, you know, convergence. And uh, we need to come up with an effective strategy to come up with a good vaccine. Not only that, uh, we also talked about uh, uh, the aptamers, so uh, we need not identify the epitopes only from the structural proteins as such, but the non-structural proteins in this case, NSP10 also plays a very important role. Um, and um, apart from ACE2 receptor, we also believe interleukin 17A uh, could also play a very important role uh, because of its association with long known coding RNA, which I didn't really describe much. Uh, because of uh, brevity of time, I apologize. Uh, but you know, this is the other uh, side of the story that we are really coming up with. So uh, a, a very important question one would always ask, uh, thanks to um, the lockdown periods, uh, at least in India, we have seen uh, the emissions you know, cutting down. We haven't seen uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, major pollutants you know, in the air because many people are not really coming out. Uh, but if, but one advice, you know, if you would like to give as a researcher for someone who is treated or affected with virus and from virus, this is the most important question. Probably you may really want to discuss with your colleagues or with with with, with lesser knowns or lesser educated people in these particular directions. I think you know we need to make a good habit to live with it, and of course we need to ensure that uh, we need to keep our working space clean. We need to come up with certain strategies, and most importantly, uh, we need to understand that. Uh, uh, that as researchers, we are bound to face uh, this COVID-19 like challenges in the future and we need to come up with preparations. And that preparation is nothing but, you know, to me, uh, collaborations and convergence. So, uh, uh, so overall, I would say that vitamin M factor, which is vitamin money, uh, is also a very important factor. The economies are really going down. So we really need to come up and uh, come up with a good strategy. 
So today, uh, in about uh, uh, 10 hours from now, we have uh, uh, Anshu Badwa who is giving uh, the BOF Galaxy India presentation, uh, in which you know BioClose is also tied up. Hatpreet, who is our finance uh, secretary, is also going to give a gist of what BioClose is about. And we have got about 600 uh, active members in BioClose who have used more than 10,000 manners of uh, Galaxy cloud usage. Uh, we have a president, uh, Jian Shastri, who is the director of NIST, uh, based in uh, Northeastern uh, Institute of Science and Technology in Assam. We have Devendra Biswal, who is also a secretary, and Sangram, uh, who has also delivered an excellent talk yesterday, who is also representing our South India chapter. So finally, I would like to thank uh, Asif, who has uh, interested me to deliver this talk and introduced me to Gareth and Dave. And uh, uh, excellent uh, conference and a wonderful team uh, uh, effort by uh, BCC, uh, BOSC, and as well as uh, Galaxy. I congratulate them and uh, uh, thank them you know, for making me a part of this and most importantly, believing in me. So uh, we really uh, need to converge. Uh, but here, and as I could see here, there is uh, a C index that I really want to draw attention for uh, Dave and Gareth here. DCX is uh, Dave, uh, which is uh, the first time you know mapped to uh, heuristically mapped to a gene, and we have a uh, Gareth here, which means that you know they keep you know working together as well. And uh, this uh, work and all the three stories that I've worked on, I've delved upon, thanks to the wonderful team efforts of BioClues. It's not just me. Uh, there are also uh, two postdocs and uh, uh, four PhD fellows behind me. Who always you know, keep working. They're excellent workers. Uh, from medical genomics, we have Keshav Singh, Gyaneshwar Chaube, Uma Kanga, and Praveen Mathur, who has introduced me to uh, Pouch Kulan, and of course, Krishna Mohan, who is my mentor as well and the head of the department here. And these are the other collaborators. And uh, the word open source to me means a lot, and uh, it would not have really uh, come nearer to me had I not been associated as a director for bioinformatics.org. And that's where, you know, Jeff Bizarro comes really into picture. So I thank you one and all, you know, for your patient hearing. I really look forward uh, for your questions. I'm open somewhere, uh, anywhere here at these emails. I'm as well in Twitter with the Twitter handle Prash Bio. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you one and all.